So today in the morning, we're going to talk about tips and tricks for complete dentures. Um, as you all know, uh, as general dentists, we are confronted with patients uh, that don't have any teeth or are completely edentulous. And I know that we have, we can all agree that these are not easy patients to, to, to restore, to treat, uh, because, uh, you know, depending on the resorption of the ridges, these cases can be very, very complex. Uh, the nice thing about, uh, you know, working around these patients and working with them is that these are lifelong, uh, lifelong patients for your practice and, and they can be very motivated. If you, if you deliver a high quality denture, you can motivate them, you can educate them, and you can always take them to the next step, which will be uh, uh, implant retained over denture. So uh, keep that in mind. Keep that, keep, uh, always think about these patients as being, you know, uh, long life patients and most importantly, potential patients for the next step, which would be uh, implant supported over denture. So let's, let's go ahead and let's get started. So we're going to start with our tip and trick number one. And again, if you have any questions, you just put them down in your chat box and I'll be more than happy to address them at the end of my presentation. Um, you know, the first tip I want to talk to you about is the importance of delivering an ideal interim denture. And, you know, sometimes we, uh, as clinicians, you know, patient presents to our clinic, we know that we're going to be doing some extractions. In this particular case, these are the teeth that we're going to extract through the maxillary arch. We will deliver to, for this patient a complete denture on the upper arch, and I'll show you uh, a video of this patient towards the end. So, um, so please uh, keep this case in mind. So we're going to extract some of the upper teeth, you know, the remainder upper teeth, and we're going to extract one mandibular tooth, and I'll show you that in a minute. But I want you to look at this photo because the important aspect uh, of, or the, of the educational aspect of this photo and what I want to make a point on is that you can see that there's a vertical dimension still present in this patient. So when you have cases like this, the ideal situation and what I like doing is I like taking the best alternate impression I can of the remaining teeth and the surrounding tissues. I want to overextend this impression. I want to make sure that I can copy all the phenoms present in the patient. I want to get a very good, very, or ideally, uh, uh, you know, the best impression I can. Sometimes I even take the time to make a preliminary impression, fabricate a tray for these patients, uh, and then get my, uh, my final quote-unquote impression for my interim denture. And the reason why I want to do this is because the interim denture plays a big, big and important role in these patients. Not only they will leave your practice with teeth, but most importantly, these uh, interim dentures will allow the tissues to heal in a, in a really good way for you to be able to, uh, you know, three to six months later, be able to make final impressions and then continue with your regular denture procedures that I'll show you uh, exactly what I mean with that step by step. But this is the mandibular arch, and that's the tooth that we're going to extract in the mandibular arch. So we're going to have a complete upper denture against a removable partial denture for this patient. Um, so this is the day of extractions. So when it comes to the extractions, we, you know, we want to be obviously as, as gentle as possible. We don't want to, you know, we want to try to avoid fracturing any, any bone. We want to try to be very minimally invasive as much as we can. Uh, and then once we do the extractions, that same day, the photo on the right, you can see that we've delivered that interim denture. That interim denture was, uh, was, was built upon the actual vertical dimension that the patient had. So it's, it's, you know, it's easier for her to get used to this, this, uh, this denture. It's easy for her to get, uh, it's easy for us to adjust uh, occlusally to, to make all the occlusal adjustments that we need on this denture. But most importantly, this denture extends well, it's well supported. It has, you know, good retention for, for, for it being an interim denture. And I do want to try to, uh, uh, you know, put out there that I do all this and I want to get this very nice and well-fitting denture base, in, even in my interim denture, because I want to try to avoid using any uh, soft tissue conditioners. Now, I don't have anything against them. I think that they're, 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 they're a really good option, and I do use them sometimes when my interim dentures or the base of my interim dentures don't fit as well as I would like, but I try to avoid them because I don't want them, you know, sometimes it's, they, they will get into all these alveolar processes after the extractions. It's, you're going to have to cut the excess off. So, it, you know, it, it can become a little bit messy. So the, be the better the fit of, my, of my, my denture base in that interim denture, 
the faster and the better off uh, I'm going to be. The faster because I extract and I deliver the denture immediately, minor adjustments are needed, and I send the patient home. And what you will find and what you will see is that, you know, this is a photo seven days after the extraction. I do inform the patient that I want them to maintain this denture uh, in their mouth for at least 48 hours after the extraction. So two days, and then after two days, they can go ahead and remove it, start rinsing, cleaning, and put the denture back in. I want them to sleep with the denture. I want them to use the denture as much as they can for the first week. Uh, so that way I have, you know, the tissue is remodeling. The bone and the tissue are both remodeling around that denture base. So that's why I want to keep them with the denture base as long as I can. And I do have them remove it and clean and do all that after the, the 48 hours. But I want them to keep it in their mouth as long as possible. The most important thing here is that I do have my patients go on a soft diet. And this is very important because, you know, as you can imagine, if we are going to be chewing, you know, you know, meats and, and, and just, just chewy food, very, very sticky or chewy food, the denture not only is going to be dislodged, but most importantly, the patient can have some, uh, some sensitivity and some inflammation going around the tissue. So as you can see, seven days later, we remove the interim denture, we take this photo, and we go ahead and we make sure that, you know, that everything is going as planned. And then we just wait for another week. I try to remove my sutures, you know, when I, when I believe that I have the best healing possible. So this is two weeks after the extractions. And you can see that my sutures are still there. So I'm going to go ahead now and I'm going to remove the sutures. But what I want you to put your attention on is the ridge. Look at the color of the ridge. Look how healthy everything appears to be. So, you know, just having your patient wear the denture, remove it and rinse and keep everything nice and clean, not having any, any uh, uh, soft tissue conditioner within the denture that may accumulate plaque is going to help definitely with the healing that in my mind and in, in what I see with my patient, it really helps. Now, can I always avoid uh, using a tissue conditioner? The answer to that question is no. And I think that we can all agree on that. It really depends on how well that denture base fits. And it really depends on how much ridge their patient has left. So for this particular case that I'm showing you that the patient has a very nice ridge, a very nice vaulted palate, I'm able to, to achieve, you know, good stability retention and support of my denture on these tissues. And that's the reason why uh, I think that we were able to uh, get a really good interim denture. But a lot of this has to do with that, with that initial impression that yes, even though I use it and I, and I do with it, I try to get an overextended impression. I try to get copy all the, the, the muscles and the frenums and everything I can. I have to, I want to get a really nice copy of the teeth and the residual ridge so that the lab can, you know, just section the teeth out and try to get that denture base to fit as best as possible in that interim denture. And then once the sutures are removed, I want to show, and I'll show you this case, I'll show you the way that we did the whole, the construction of the denture. But what I want to show you right now is that two year post uh, extraction photo of the ridge. So I've been following this patient for a while and I, I apologize for the difference in color of the photo. I just, you know, fairly uh, recently got a new camera. So that's what you're seeing there. But what I want you to see on that photo on the right hand side, and you can, we can all agree on that is how nice uh, the healing of the ridge, how nice this ridge has been able to be maintained. You can see that there is a little bit of resorption present in the canine or mesial to the canine area, but that's normal. The first, you know, we all know that the first year after the extractions, that's when the resorption is going to be, uh, that, that's the highest point of resorption that you're going to get. But after that, resorption stabilizes and you will see that your denture base uh, you know, will, will, will fit properly. Now, one thing that I do tell my patients is that if during that time the denture loses a little bit of retention or stability, we will reline the denture uh, at no extra cost. So we do add in our in our uh, in the cost of our complete procedure of our total uh, uh, dental procedure, we always have an added cost for a future reline, and uh, because normally it will be necessary at least after the first year. And again, it all depends on the type of uh, resorption that they have. But I'll show you some other ways that we try to combat that normal resorption that you're going to have after the extractions. So this now brings me to my, my tip and trick number two. Uh, and the tip and trick number two is that, okay, now you have your teeth extracted. You've waited, you know, three, four months, whichever time you decide to wait after the teeth have been extracted and the patient's been using their interim denture. But now you got to make a final impression because now you have to fabricate your definitive denture. 
And this is where, um, this is the way I do it. This is the way I was trained. And I just, you know, most likely many of you do it the same way. Others may have a little bit of a different technique. I do want to share this particular impression technique because this is going to take, this is going to make a really good point when it comes time for the impression and, you know, the different materials that we have available for uh, final impressions. And at the same time for the construction of my denture base, which I believe is crucial at the time of, you know, phonetics and evaluation of my, uh, of my, uh, uh, you know, wax trying, teeth wax trying. So please keep that in mind. And that's the reason why I'm going to go in a little bit into depth of the, on the way that I uh, fabricate these trays. Now, do I fabricate my trays for every patient? And the answer to that is no. I, I have shared uh, the way that I want it done with my lab. And this is the way they do it. I'm just showing you a case where I did it myself. But this is what I show my lab. Uh, and, you know, this is the, the conversation that I have with my lab tech. And I tell them this is exactly the way that I want my trays designed when I send them to you for fabrication of my, of, of my custom tray for final impressions. So what you're seeing on the right hand, on the left hand side of the screen is, a, is, a, is just a cast that I that obtained out of my alginate impression. And once I get this cast, I'm gonna use this blue and red pencil just to kind of outline the areas where I'm gonna place my wax and the areas where I'm not gonna have any wax. And you can see on that, uh, on the second photo to the left, you can see that I have right at the bottom of, the, of my buckle fold, I have that blue line drawn all the way uh, to the retromolar pad, hamular notches, and all the way to the post dam, and then again, back to the, to the uh, vestibular frenum. That blue line is where my tray is gonna, that's the extension of my tray. I wanna be one to two millimeters away from that blue line. That's how much my tray is gonna extend, and that's the room that I'm gonna leave for my border molding. The red line is right on the crest of the ridge. So the remainder of the ridge, that's where I'm gonna drop that red line and I'm gonna connect it slightly short from the hammer notch and into the palette. And the reason why I do that is because that area, that palatal extension or a process of the maxillary bone is where I know that there's the least amount of resorption throughout the lifespan of our patients without teeth. So everything else, everything beyond that palate is going to resorb, is going to change with time. The palate is going to change as well. But, you know, 10, 15 years, you're probably going to find, and the literature supports this, you're probably going to find 3 to 5% of resorption in that area compared to greater than 15, 20, even 40% in the rest of the areas. So this is an area where you're going to have the least amount of resorption. And for that reason, this is the area that I want to use as my, as my primary area of support, the palate. So for that reason, I put that red line there and that's the zone that I call the no wax zone. So when you go to the far right hand side, now you see my cast, you see that I've placed the wax and I've just removed the wax from the crest of the ridge all the way to the palate. And that area is an area where my acrylic is gonna be in direct or intimate contact with my palate. And you will see when, when I fabricate my tray, and I'll show you step by step the way that I do this, is I add a sheet of wax on top of everything extending to, that, to the, the buckle fold. And then using a blade, I just remove the wax on the palette. So as you can see on this cast on the far right hand side, there is no wax on the palette. There's only wax from the mid crest all the way to the buckle folds. And that's the area when I, when I fabricate my tray, you can see that I've Put, I'm, I'm using triad here, and I'm going to use two different colors of triad to make this very, very clear to you. I'm using now a pink triad directly onto the palette. Obviously, that palette, the stone at this point has a little bit of Vaseline so that this doesn't stick to it. But I'm going to put pressure with my finger on that triad, and I'm going to make sure that it adapts very, very well to the palette. Once I do that and I like cure it, then I go ahead and I use a clear tray, and I put it on top of everything. So the idea is that now I've created room on that buckle area, and you can see it right here. I've created number one, this no wax zone where the acrylic is in intimate contact with the palette, but at the same, seen on, in red on this left-hand photo. But in blue, you see my no wax zone. And that no wax zone is where my impression material, that's the room I've created for my impression material. And the reason why I do this is because my preferred impression technique 
And I know this is going to sound crazy because compound is a very old material, but it's a great material. And I love it. And I use it a lot because I like it. It's inexpensive. It's in my hands. It's very easy to use. But most importantly, it's a very predictable impression material. Now, can you do this differently? Yes, you can. And I'll show you a different technique using PBS. And I know that maybe the majority of you that are listening to me today use PBS. And that's great. There's no, the, the important thing here is not the material. The important thing here is the actual technique. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side is a completed impression. So when I use compound, what you see on that, the center, the pink area on the right-hand side, that's the acrylic in direct contact with the palette. That's exactly what you're seeing on the left-hand photo in red, where it says no wax zone. That palette, that acrylic is in intimate contact with the patient's palette. Now, my boulder molding, you see that extends all the way to the mid crest of the ridge. So I have in all that blue area that you see where the wax zone is, is where the compound goes. So the compound will end right at that little lip or step that you have between both acrylics. And that's where my impression ends. And what I have noticed, and if, if you know, for the, for the ones that are out there that have used compound before and have used this technique, this impression technique, once you use the compound, this fits so well and it's so well adapted and you have full extension, as you can see here, and you've copied every single muscle. Removing this tray with compound out of the patient's mouth is very difficult because now you feel the suction. You feel the retention that this tray, this impression is actually achieved within the patient's mouth. And I'll show you at the end, what, how does this translate to actual delivery of your final denture or your final prosthesis? So again, this is another way that you can do this. You don't have to use compound. You can use PBS, but again, the tray design is exactly the same. So I still have the acrylic touch the palette. I want to use the palette as my primary area of support. So I'm going to now use PBS adhesive around the tray and the borders of the tray. And I'm going to border mold. And again, you're seeing right there where the no wax zone is and where the wax, the wax zone is. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to border mold using PBS. And I normally, when I use this technique, which is a very good technique and I like it as well, I truly enjoy using the compound more, but that's just my preference. It doesn't mean that one is better than the other. This is a good technique and a more modern technique. And most likely many people would say that it's an easier technique because the materials will auto mix very easily. So what I do is I actually use bite registration material and I use it, you know, I go one half first of the tray, then I do the other half, and then I do the post parallel seal. And as you can see, I have now obtained on the left-hand photo, you can see all my border molding, all the, you know, the, 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 the most deep portion of the buckle fold and all the muscles and freedoms are, are there, all the freedom attachments are there. Now I'm going to go ahead and do a wash impression. I add adhesive to the entirety of the tray and I do my final wash impression. Now, that's what you're seeing on the right-hand side. Now, I want you to look at something. I want you to see that there's a little line that I've been able to mark there, and I want you to keep an eye on that mark because I'll talk a little bit about that in a couple of more slides. But the most important thing is that sometimes you will have, and again, I'm showing you here another patient, and on the left-hand side, you can see that I've been able to do my border molding using the same type of tray. I have the pink area that is in, in intimate contact with the palate. But sometimes you will find that in certain patients, if the tray was not, uh, you know, was not designed correctly, you will see that there is a little bit of retention, but it's not the ideal retention. You don't have ideal stability with this tray and only the compound. So the question is, would you, are you able to do a wash impression even when you're using a compound uh, border molding technique? And the answer to that question is yes. Just make sure that you add the adhesive on the compound and on the palette. And as you can see on the right-hand side, for this particular case, for this particular patient, we, were, we needed to do a wash impression to get a, you know, better stability of the actual impression uh, with the compound in the patient's mouth. Stability and retention. So this is very important. And again, it's just, these are different techniques. I know that many of you may be using different materials and that's okay. It's, it's all about the actual technique and the design of the tray. Materials, you can use whatever you use in your practice and most likely it'll, it'll work very well if you follow a good protocol. The most important thing that I, wanted, I want you to know is that if I make 10 of these impressions using compound, 
I would say that at least seven of them don't require any wash impression and I'm done with my impression only using compound. Uh, maybe three of them will require uh, for me to do a wash impression. And when you're gonna do a wash impression, make sure that you use a very light material, a very runny material so that you can copy all the details and actually you're gonna add to your compound. Uh, you're not gonna add the details to your compound. So what would be my tip and trick number three? So now that we have our final impression, one thing that I want to share with you is that I usually go back into the patient's mouth and I use these Thompson color transfer sticks and I mark the area where the soft tissue, the soft palate and the hard palate come together. That's going to be my post time area. This is the area when I work, where I want to achieve my, my ideal paddle sealed so that I don't get any food uh, going within the, uh, the danger and patient's tongue you know, feels a, a smoother transition in that area as well. So what I like doing is that when I'm making my compound impression, or even if I'm using PVS, I want to go in and I want to use this Thompson uh, sticks and color that area, you know, paint that area within the patient's mouth, seat the denture, and what you're seeing on the right-hand side, and I just, because it's kind of hard to see on the compound because the compound is green, but I've outlined with a white line the area that I was able to mark on my compound. So now I know that I'm slightly overextended and I can always go back and trim the excess. So this is what I normally do just to make sure that I'm right at the post dam seal. I may leave a little bit of compound, maybe a millimeter of compound extra in that area. And what I'm doing is that if you do have a, uh, a, um, a PVS impression like you're seeing here on the left-hand side, I do the same thing. I mark that area and I go back in with the impression tray I put it in the patient's mouth, I remove it, and I can see where that line was drawn. And all I do is grab a brand new Thompson stick and just go ahead and repaint it on the, on the actual PVS so that when I pour my cast or the lab pours a cast, they will see exactly where that post time area, where do I want them to design it. And then it's all about them going in, trimming the cast and making sure that they get that post, that very nice and thick lip of acrylic all the way back there so that you don't have any problems with food impaction, and, and most importantly for me is gag reflex and the tongue doesn't feel that huge step in that transition. So it is more comfortable definitely for the patient. But the most important aspect of the post dam is the post parallel seal that you will get that vacuum form back there where you can get a lot of suction within your denture. So my tip and trick number four is going to be now I have my impression, I send it to the lab, the lab will fabricate my master cast, and I'm going to ask them to fabricate what has been known as a process base. So what you're seeing right now is that same first patient where we did all the extractions and I have my final impression. This is her process base. So you can see in this process base, the lab has created my post amp seal. This is my final pros the, the final base for my prosthesis. So when you use a process base, the beauty of this technique is that this is the final denture base where your teeth are going to be set and flasked again at a later date. So this denture base is literally going to should fit like a glove into the patient's mouth. And that's the reason why I like this technique, because the other way around would be creating a denture base out of triad and then the lab doing, you know, the wax set up rims and all that for you. The downside with that technique, when you compare that technique to this technique, is that that a triad is not an intimate contact. It doesn't copy all the details of, your, uh, of the impression. It's only there to fabricate a base and to hold the wax. So when you take it to the patient's mouth, sometimes you're going to have to use some adhesive so that you can create some stability of that denture base into the patient's mouth. Well, with this process base, this is my final process base. This co has copied every single detail of my final impression. And this is flask acrylic. And the other thing is that I, what I want you to see on the right hand side is that the lab has created enough room for them to wax, be able to put the wax rims, be able to add the teeth, and then be able to do a second flask for them to literally connect the final teeth setup to this denture base. So again, this is my final denture base. Now, what do you do with this final denture base or this process base when you get it? Well, when you initially get it, I normally don't want to have it with wax. I do the wax. I, I add the wax myself 
obviously because I want to save an appointment, but what I want to do first, because this is my final base, I want to make sure that I use some PIP paste and I want to make sure that I achieve a very nice and firm adaptation of this denture base to the actual edentulous ridge. So I want to make sure that there's no more pressures on one side than the other, that the patient feels very, very comfortable. And what you're going to notice here is that when you put this denture base in the patient's mouth with that PIP, removing the denture base becomes a challenge because that PIP acts like a, uh, like a uh, denture adhesive. And even without the PIP base, this denture base, once it goes in, and this is a full extension uh, process base, you can see how you know, the thickness of the, of the buckle folds and all the freedoms are there. So when we go, when we take this to the patient's mouth, it literally is very nice and stable. And I'll show you in another tip that I'm going to give you why I think this is so important. But what you're seeing on the far right-hand side is that denture base being after the, the PIP base and after all the, you know, the, the reduction that I needed to do within the intaglio surface in order for me to get even pressure throughout the ridges. This is now my final photo with that denture, uh, process denture base within the patient's mouth. So now, from now on, that's not going to change. I know this is very nice and stable. I know that when I'm going to get my vertical dimension and my centric bite record, this denture base is not going to go anywhere. It's going to be very nice and stable. I'm able to get a Facebook. I'm able to get a bite registration. I mount my cast, and then I can go ahead and send this to the lab and have the lab set their teeth. But this is the other important aspect of this process base. And this is an article that me and Dr. Thomas DeRose, so this is a case report that we actually published in 2016 in Compendium. And this is with the technique that I'm, gonna, that I'm gonna share with you right now. So when I have my denture base, what I like doing, and I know that I know a lot of colleagues that do this, that do the same technique using, using a different setup. So uh, I know a, a colleague of mine, very good friend, very good dentist, that instead of using this wax rim that we use, he actually sets six teeth from canine to canine on the denture, on the denture basis that he uses. Now, that being said, I want you to remember, this is my final denture base. This is my process base. So this is a different patient. There's a process base. And what we like doing, what I like doing is I like cutting a very thin layer of wax and I'm going to mimic, this wax is going to mimic from canine to canine on the maxillary arch and on the mandibular arch. And I do want to say something here that is very important for you to understand. Normally, when you have really big resorptions on your mandibular arch and you're using a regular uh, uh, denture base made out of triad, it's, we all can agree that it's very hard for us to get that vertical dimension, that phonetics try-in, because this denture base moves everywhere. When you're using your process base and you have a lot of resorption, because this is your final denture base and it fits like a glove, Yes, I sometimes would need to add a little bit of adhesive to keep it in place, but it stays in place very well. And I am going to show you with this case, we do the same thing on the mandibular arch, only from canine to canine, we add this little wax. And the height of this wax at this point is arbitrary. What we're going to do is that we're going to define, we're going to define within the patient's mouth. And this is a patient that is completely edentulous. So I have a process based on the maxillary arch. I have a process based on a very resorbed mandibular arch. And you can see this patient is probably 75 years old. And now what I'm doing is I'm having a conversation with him. And I want you to see that during these conversation, and you can see the left, the left hand photo, the photo on the left, far left hand side, and the photo on the far right hand side, I'm literally having a conversation with him and taking all these photos while I'm having the conversation. And during that conversation, um, you know, we're using S words, we're using F words, we're determining exactly where that incisal edge position of the maxillary arch should be and how they're going to interact with the incisal edge position of the mandibular incisors once we have these teeth placed in the dentures. At this point, I only use wax. It's a lot easier. It's a lot faster than setting six teeth. I can do it myself. And you can see on the middle photo, the patient is smiling and you can see that my incisal edge is a little bit too long. So I can go back, I can heat a spatula, a wax spatula, and just remove a little bit of wax and get that incisal edge exactly where I want it. So towards the end, we connect all this with a bite registration material. We add a little bit of wax to the posterior areas of, of the denture basis, and we have the patient swallow, and we get a new vert we get a centric relation bite record. We remove this from the patient's mouth. We have our midline and our canines marked in that wax. 
But the most important photo is this one right here. At this point, I am measuring from the, uh, the depth of the buckle fold or the rim of my process base in the, in the buckle area of the denture all the way down to the position of my incisal edges. The position that I have determined through phonetics in the patient's mouth with the denture base while I have been doing that appointment with my patient. So at this point, I'm, I'm going to select the teeth and I select the width and the length of the teeth and I'm going to tell my lab, I want these teeth at, at this point, you can see that it's 10, 15, this is 15 millimeters away. The incisal edge should be located 15 millimeters from the process base, from the rim or the edge of that process base. And that's what the lab is giving me on the left-hand side. Now, for teaching purposes, I have had the lab, in, in this uh, uh, case, only add the anterior six teeth. Now, I do that with some frequency when I have patients with very, very resorbed ridges, and it's been more difficult for me to kind of keep these denture bases in place. And I know that we've all been confronted with cases like that. So if I'm not 100% sure that my centrigulation bite record was a perfect bite record, I only have them add the 12 teeth, six maxillary, six mandibular teeth. We do, we test phonetics again. And now, again, we're using my final denture base, my process base. The teeth are waxed on top of this denture base. And I'm now having a new conversation with this patient, making sure that my teeth are there. And then I go ahead and I, and I do a new centric bite record just to make sure that I cross mount and that I'm, I, I, I proved to myself that I was able to obtain a correct uh, uh, vertical dimension and centric bite record. Now, that being said, this does not happen frequently. It doesn't happen with every single patient. But in this particular patient, because of the amount of resorption that he had, I felt more comfortable knowing that I had achieved a really good centric relation bite record. And on the right-hand side, you can see now all the teeth are being waxed to those two denture bases. Uh, and then after that, all, all, all that happens is that my lab will flask a second time and flask these new teeth to these denture bases. Now, going back to the patient that I showed you at the beginning with, all, with the extractions that we had completed, this is exactly the same technique. What I've done here is I've done, I, the lab had added some wax to my denture base, and all I did was cut that wax in half. So again, I'm trying to keep just two to three millimeters on that facial aspect so that I can have that conversation with the patient. And, I, and because, because I like the position and she liked the position of the teeth and the, dis, the amount of display that she had on her interim denture, we were just trying to duplicate that. And you can see on the photo, I'm trying to stay right at the same level so that the lab can go ahead and redo the teeth or reset these teeth right at that same level. But the most important aspect is because she has my final denture base and the wax is on that denture base, I'm able to now control as well another important factor, which is lip support. And you can see on the far left-hand photo, this is without the denture in place, without the denture base and the wax in place. In the middle photo is exactly where, how we got it from the lab and we needed, we felt that it was too bulky. So we removed a little bit of wax from that denture base. And you can see my right hand photo all the way far to the right, where we were able to reduce a little bit the amount of lip support to make it look more natural. The patient felt you know, much more comfortable. So I want you to keep that in mind that this is something that you can definitely change if needed while you are in the process of setting those teeth. And this brings me to my tip and trick number five. Now, we have, uh, uh, we, we set this back to the, to the lab, the lab at the teeth, and this is the day of delivery. No, no uh, adhesive was used for, to retain this denture. Patient couldn't even get the denture out. And I want you to look how, how, I mean, she's really trying to get the denture out, but this denture is not going anywhere. And you know what? We knew this from the day that we did the denture base trying. She could not get the denture base out without any teeth. So we knew from day one, before we did any vertical dimension, before we did any centric bite records, before we tried any teeth with wax, we knew that this denture base was rock solid. It had a good retention, good stability, and ideal support. So if the patient is not able to remove the denture the day of delivery, I think that that is a good sign. Now, this is her phonetics, and I'm going to just...
So again, you can see that not only the retention was ideal, but the phonetics was well. And I truly believe, and this is anecdotal, this is just my perspective, my clinical experience. Uh, I've been a dentist for 25 years, and in my clinical experience, all this, all these, you know, phonetics and centrifugation and vertical dimension, all being predetermined with a rock solid denture base has helped me a lot to get to this point that when I deliver my dentures, my patients are, you know, they, they, the, the speech was right on the spot. And we obviously cross mount and we adjust the, the actual teeth on the articulator before we go to the patient. And you know, you know how all this goes. But the most important thing is that we feel that the process is a very, you know, step-by-step, -step, very well-designed process that it takes us very easily to a really good final outcome. And my final tip and trick for you today is, okay, so I have a denture. Patients have been my patients for, you know, 10, 15 years. I'm in practice and I'm doing great. But now one of these patients comes to me and says, hey, you know, I love your dentures. I love what you, do, what you did for me. I love all the care that you've, you've given me these past 10 or 15 years. But you know what? I'm ready for the next step. I'm ready for some implants in my mandibular arch. I'm ready for my, some implants in my maxillary arch. I'm ready to go from a regular set of dentures to an overdenture. Now in your office, you have two options. Either you're going to use their denture, the one that you fabricated, the one that you're very happy with, and you send it to the lab and they'll go ahead and duplicate the denture and charge you for that. Or you duplicate the denture yourself within your office and you can train somebody to do it in your office. And, I'm, and I know that many of you most likely are doing this already in your office, but I'm going to show you a very simple technique on how to duplicate these dentures using these two maxillary trays. So we only use maxillary trays regardless if the denture is upper, is, is a maxillary denture or a mandibular denture. We use only maxillary trays. And I'm going to walk you through the process. So what we do is we use lab putty and we mix, you know, two to three scoops of the lab putty, depending on the size of the tray and the size of the denture that you, you're going to be duplicating. And we, and we push in first, in this particular case, we're going to duplicate a maxillary denture. So we're going to go ahead and sink that, in, that denture, the prosthesis that the patient is actually using, we're going to sink it within that putty matrix. And at the same time, we're going to cut these four notches that you see on the left-hand side that are marked with these red arrows. Once this impression sets, you're going to go ahead and you're going to add some wax. I'm, I'm sorry, not wax, some Vaseline to the, uh, to the intaglio surface of the denture and to all the already polymerized PVS and within the notches. So what you're seeing on the right-hand side is I just went ahead and removed the maxillary denture so that you can see what we have, how, the, how good and how uh, you know, pristine and precise is this impression. You don't see any irregularities within the area that we need to copy for the denture. So we go ahead, we put the denture back in, and now using a, the, the second maxillary tray, and you can see that we're not using any type of uh, uh, tray adhesives, we then mix two to three new scoops of this uh, a lab putty. We put it within the intaglio surface of the maxillary denture, and then we press that with a maxillary tray. We make sure that the new impression, the top portion of that impression, goes within the notches that we've created on that first impression, and then we let it set. So what do you end up having? You end up having this. This is now that impression of the intaglio surface of your denture with those four notches so that these two become a very nice jig that you fabricated in your office. And this takes literally 10 to 15 minutes. So once you duplicate this denture, your patient is gonna leave your office with his denture. You're not gonna have to send his denture to the lab. You're not gonna keep the, you don't have to keep the denture overnight in your office. You do it right there or chair side. You go ahead, you make these impressions. Now all you have to do is just grab some clear acrylic and you can use orthoacrylic or any type of acrylic that you want, and you're going to pour it within the uh, cameo surface of this impression, and then you're going to use the intaglio surface, and you're going to put it right on top. You, you connect them both with a, some rubber bands, and you put them in under some hot water. You can put, even put it on a pressure pot, let the acrylic set, and this is what you're going to get. You're going to get a perfect duplicate of that denture. And let me tell you, when we use these dentures, they literally fit like very, very precisely. They, they fit... Uh, 
kind of like the, the final issue. I'm not going to say exactly like, because th this is going to have some alterations, but it's, they're going to be minimal and they will be able to fit in. Not only you can use this for your, as your surgical template, but you can use this duplicate denture as your uh, radiographic template for your CBCTs. And I'm just going to show you a really quick example. This is a case that one of my residents actually did at the beginning of this year. And you can see that we duplicated the mandibular denture in this particular case using exactly the same technique. Then we went ahead and we added some composite to the, to the, uh, some of the teeth and we had the CBCT. And because we had composite added to the actual uh, duplicate of the denture during the CBCT, during the, uh, you know, when we were obtaining the CBCT, we were now able to read in the CBCT exactly which were the best sites for us to place the, the implants. So we, once we decided which areas we were gonna place these implants, we went ahead and we cut those two windows that you see on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side is the day of surgery. And what you're seeing there is that, that, uh, that duplicate denture that my resident did for her patient. She went ahead, put it in the patient's mouth and did her two bleeding points with the, uh, with the initial drill so that she can know exactly which are the areas that she's gonna guide. And uh, what you're seeing here is just kind of like a quick summary of the surgical procedure. She placed both implants. Now you see the surgical guide with both implants in place and right on top of the, uh, of the site before suturing so that you can see that we're, we're, we're uh, very well located based out of the plan that we initially had. So these not only can be used as your uh, radiographic uh, template, but as your surgical guide as well. So, you know, if you think about it, you, you can, you can uh, shoot two birds with one, with one bullet just by, by following this technique.